Welcome to the August webinar in the National Secret Law Center's webinar series. I thank everyone for joining us today. We will be recording the webinar and posting it on our website, so if you have to leave early or if you have colleagues that weren't able to make the webinar today, um, it will be available, and um, we encourage you to share it and, and watch it later. And so today, um, following along with the theme of the National Sea Grant 50th anniversary, we wanted to share a little information about our graduate programs um, that are part of the Sea Grant Legal Network. And so I'm Stephanie Ott. I'm the director of the National Sea Grant Law Center. And I'm going to be joined here today with Julia Wyman, who's the director of the Rhode Island Sea Grant Legal Program, and Lisa Chivanato, who's the director of the North Carolina Coastal Resources Law Planning and Policy Center, and one of Lisa's uh, former students to, to talk a little bit about the different programs that are available throughout the country. As I'll talk about in a little bit, the legal network is very diverse, and each program is set up a little differently, so the opportunities available to law students and other graduate students with our programs um, are a little different. So I'll go ahead and get started, and if you have questions as we go along, feel free to use the chat box um, to let us know. Um, and then we also have time at the end for questions. So just a little bit of background about the Sea Grant Legal Network. The Sea Grant Legal Network is an informal network um, within the kind of larger Sea Grant Network. Um, we formalized in 2009 for three primary reasons. One was to raise awareness of Sea Grant's law and policy programming that was happening around the country. Uh, we wanted to facilitate collaboration among those programs. And then also to support Sea uh, Grant's law and policy efforts locally, regionally, and nationally. And so for those of you who are familiar with Sea Grant, um, some of the Sea Grant legal programs have been around for a very long time from the beginning, back in the 70s, and others are new. Um, and part of the efforts of the Sea Grant Legal Network were really to let people within the network know about the diversity of legal programming within Sea Grant um, and, like I said, help to um, raise collaboration between those And the membership of the Sea Grant Legal Network, um, we have what we refer to as core programs. These are programs that are, uh, over the years, have been consistently funded by a particular Sea Grant program or the National Sea Grant Office. And so these are more formal programs that usually have multiple staff um, associated with them, so they're a little more funding. Um, they have the National Sea Grant Law Center, which is funded directly by the National Sea Grant Office to provide support to all the programs around the country. And then we have four state-based legal programs in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, North Carolina, and Rhode Island. Um, and these programs are funded and embedded through the Sea Grant programs as part of either their omnibus or a um, kind of standalone award within the omnibus, but they are focused on state work most of the time, some regional work, and then collaboration nationally through the Sea Grant Legal Network. In addition, we also have several attorneys around the country that work with Sea Grant programs in a variety of capacities. Some are attorneys that are now working in Sea Grant in extension type positions, so Kathy Bunning covers in New York Sea Grant, who's the extension director, and we also have Nicole Fagan in Oregon, who is um, a planning extension specialist, but she's also an attorney. And Nicole Wang has an attorney that works for time on coastal hazards, uh, Dennis Wang. Um, and 
And then we have um, a couple of programs that have um, affiliated or have partnerships with their law schools or policy programs within their institutions at Florida, Georgia, and Washington. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of diversity. There's a lot of different ways that C grant programs are able to build their legal capacity, um, and they don't all do it through the creation of a formal standalone legal program. Some do it through partnerships um, with other uh, institutes within their own institutions or um, with, with practicing attorneys. Um, that work on some of the applied issues that they need. So before uh, I start talking about the opportunities that the C-Grant Legal Network offers to law students, I thought it might be helpful to just give a bit of a background on kind of legal education and how it's different from the traditional, you know, science graduate education um, because it's comes into play with respect to the type of opportunities um, that the Sea Grant Legal Network can offer, and also because um, most of the Sea Grant folks come from the graduate school world and, and may not be familiar um, with some of the unique features of legal education. So law schools are professional schools, and I think it's always important to keep in mind that they're not graduate schools. Law schools are usually not part of the formal graduate school at the institution, which means that law students are not graduate students. And so they're not receiving stipends. There's no teaching requirements. Um, it's a professional school like, you know, business schools and MBA programs. And uh, most law schools offer a three-year curriculum, um, which have a mix of required and elective courses. And so the first year of law school is kind of standard. Um, at your law school, the students take all of the same classes. But then in their second and third years, they are able to select electives. And that's where a lot of the courses that the Cedar and Legal Networks people offer for different curriculums come into play because we offer the elective courses and get the upper level students who are interested in environmental law and ocean and coastal um, planning and those types of activities. Although law students are not classified as graduate students, some law schools do offer joint degrees through other professional schools. For instance, it's common to have a JD MBA program or you may have a, a mechanism that allows you to earn a graduate degree at the same time that you're, you're doing your law school degree. And so, for instance, when I was at Vermont Law School, I was in a joint degree program where I got my JD, but I also got a master's in environmental law. And lots of law schools throughout the country have, you know, different programs like that um, that kind of cut across the traditional law school graduate student programming. One thing that's important for uh, C-Grant and how I think we have a lot of opportunities for the C-Grant Legal Network to, to really engage and, and build and enhance what's happening at, at law schools is that in recent years, there's become an increasing focus within law schools on experiential learning, so getting students hands-on uh, learning with real-world legal pro problems in kind of real-world settings. And so law schools in the last 20 years have really, you know, built up their clinical programs where students can shadow practicing attorneys and are representing real clients, but also to encourage students to do more internships and externships um, and having different types of classes within their law schools that really focus on that experiential learning. And all of the C-Grant programs can provide that type of experience for those students. And just one last piece to, to get a feel for kind of the life of a law student. Um, students, law students generally are limited, don't work more than 20 hours a week during the semester. So while they're taking classes, um, they're usually working within their institution um, with a faculty member, maybe at the library or through some sort of other um, internship or externship where they're getting academic credit. But during the summer, between their classes, outside 
employment, you know, at law firms or a government agency and nonprofit um, is commonly happening in the summer. And so, um, for instance, I'll come back to the National Theater Art Law Center during the semester. We primarily work with students at the University of Mississippi. But over the summer, we work with students at, you know, a lot of different law schools because they're looking for outside employment and they're moving around during the summer. So, there's two kinds of things that the National Center has worked in every outside with education. First, we are housed within the University of Mississippi School of Law, and while the staff of the National Sea Grant Law Center do not have faculty appointments, so none of us are tenure track staff of the law school, but we are approved to teach courses. And the presence of the National Theater at Law Center here at the University of Mississippi School of Law allows us to enhance the curriculum at the law school and provide opportunities for our students that wouldn't be possible without the presence of the National Theater at Law Center. And so I teach a foundational course in ocean and coastal law every year. Um, Catherine Janesey, one of our staff attorneys, teaches natural resources law and water law. Um, this year, she's teaching agricultural law for the first time because that hasn't been offered for a while at the law school. And so based on, you know, the desires of the students and, and what our faculty is looking for um, with respect to offerings, um, we have participated in a range of ways um, here at the law school. Um, we also provide a number of experiential learning opportunities for our students. As I mentioned, University of Mississippi students have opportunities to work um, with the National Sea Grant Law Center as research assistants during the semester for hourly wages. Uh, students here at the University of Mississippi and other law schools can contribute to our publications, um, the Sandbar, which is our quarterly newsletter, um, but also other publications such as the Grant Law and Policy Journal. And also students can earn academic credit through an externship with us, um, or if they would like us to supervise an independent study, um, we've done that as well. So there's a lot of different ways that, that we work with students here on campus. Um, and the same is true for all of the Sea Grant legal programs um, that are out there. So many of these same Opportunities exist at Louisiana um, and the other programs, um, but for today, we wanted to just take a little while and, and let you hear from a couple of the other programs about the way that they are offering opportunities for law students, um, because as I mentioned, they're all a little different and unique. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Julia Wyman to share a little bit about the opportunities um, with the Rhode Island program. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yep. Go ahead. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so uh, thank you very much for um, including me and uh, the Rhode Island Sea Grant Legal Program in this webinar. Um, so the Rhode Island Sea Grant Legal Program is located at the Marine Affairs Institute, which is at the Roger Williams University School of Law. And we are a true partnership in every sense of the word. Um, so we're located at the law school, um, but we are full partners with Rhode Island Sea Grant and then also with the University of Rhode Island. Um, and one of the things that we have that's a little bit different than some of the other programs is we do have a joint degree program with the University of Rhode Island. So that means that our law students can get um, a joint degree with their JD and then their Master of Marine Affairs over at the University of Rhode Island. Um, it's a great opportunity for our students, especially those that are interested in going into policy, um, to really jump into uh, more classes focused on ocean and coastal issues. Um, for students to do that, they apply during their second year of law school. So as Stephanie said, that first year of law school is really reserved to take the core courses that all law students have to take um, in law school. Uh, but then our students apply usually during the first semester, at the very end of their first semester, second year. 
um, they get accepted into the program, and then starting their third year of law school, they're taking courses at Roger Williams School of Law and then also at University of Rhode Island. And through a memorandum of understanding, we have um, the students are able to exchange those courses um, for credit at both institutions. Um, we've sort of mapped that out over the years, and it's been a very successful program. Um, another thing that we have here at uh, the Rhode Island Sea Grant Legal Program is the Law Fellow Program, and that is really um, a very, very important part of our program where we take second and third year law students and we match them up with outside organizations that have questions of marine law or policy. Um, so with that, if an outside organization has a question that they're, they're looking to get some information on uh, related to ocean and coastal law and policy, but they don't necessarily want to hire an attorney, um, they can come to us and working with our staff. So our staff consists of myself as the director, um, a staff attorney, Reed Porter, um, and then we also have a program coordinator. Um, but working directly with our staff attorney, um, the outside organization will work on that question, get it down to a, a pretty decent, um, succinct question for a law student, and then the student will work for a semester researching that, that specific question. Uh, for our students, we find that it's, it's a really great opportunity to work directly with our staff attorney. Um, so they get direct supervision here at the Marine Affairs Institute. Um, but then also get that experience working with the outside organization. And the students, as Stephanie said, um, with, with their program, students here can also get paid or they can get credit for that project. And they can do um, a law fellow project multiple times throughout their time in law school. So um, unlike a class, they can repeat it, they can get credit, they can get paid. Um, another part of that program, the Law Fellow program that we do, um, and, and it's important to note that for all of the Sea Grant legal programs, um, we don't engage in advocacy or litigation. So unlike the typical clinic that you may hear of at a law school, um, we're not taking on cases and we're not advocating for clients. So our research is strictly um, neutral, academic-based research. Um, and all of our information, when we're done researching a project, will be available or is available on the Sea Grant library uh, so that anybody can access that. Um, so our students can, can engage as law fellows all throughout their second and third year of law school. They can also do it during the summers. Um, similar to other law schools, we adhere to the law students only working under 20 hours a week, but during the summer we tend to have students that work a lot more than 20 hours because they're not taking courses. Um, we also have externship programs here that we match students up um, that are that want to really get involved in the day-to-day -day operations of an outside organization. So unlike the Law Fellow Project where they do a lot of the research on their own and here in our Marine Affairs office, um, they would actually go to the placement and um, act like any other employee at that at that place. Um, and then the only other thing that I'll highlight from our program is that we really do stay committed to educating the students sort of in and outside of the classroom. So we have a lot of opportunities for guest speakers. We do things like other graduate students do with like brown bag lunches, um, afternoon speakers. Um, and then we also educate the outside community, um, including lawyers. We do continuing legal education. Um, and ocean and coastal professionals, so maybe the management um, community here in Rhode Island or in New England, um, through conferences and symposiums that we, we hold every other year, typically. That's, that's pretty much the Rhode Island program in a nutshell. Great, Julia, thanks so much. It's always good to, to see the big picture. <laughs> I forget about the pieces of everybody's program. Okay, that sounds great. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Lisa Chivinato to, to give a similar overview of the North Carolina program. And we're also really lucky today to have Rory Fleming with us, who's one of us, one of the former students who worked with Lisa in North Carolina. And he'll share some of his thoughts and insights after Lisa has the chance to, to kind of give the introduction. So Lisa, you're off mute now and you can go ahead. 
All right, thank you very much, Stephanie. Hello, everybody. I'm happy to be here this afternoon. I'm especially glad that Rory can join us as well, because I know he's really busy. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the law student and graduate student opportunities that we offer at the North Carolina Coastal Resources Law Center and Policy Center. And this is an inter-institutional partnership between North Carolina Sea Grant, the UNC School of Law, and the UNC Department of City and Regional Planning. And so we have um, pretty much a three-part, uh, three different ways that students can become involved in our center and provide a lot of experiential learning opportunities as well as other opportunities to, in, to engage in outreach activities. So I'm going to talk about our, we also have a law fellowship program that I'll focus probably a little bit more on because of uh, the topic of this webinar. But we also have an environmental policy internship program and a coastal policy fellowship. So, you know, like Stephanie had mentioned before, that we're seeing more and more in law schools uh, this increase in focus on experiential learning. And the law fellowship at my law and policy center focuses on that a great deal. So they are doing the typical legal research with output in the form of memos and things like that. But we like to be able to provide them with um, with a focus on the impact of real that legal issues have in the real world and the types of barriers to implementing solutions to coastal challenges that can arise in a legal context. And we also try to get them to provide them with experience um, with the intersection between law, policy, and the law. And a lot of that focuses on really pairing them with stakeholders and sometimes with extension specialists here in the North Carolina Sea Grant Office on projects. So they always have that opportunity to work with professionals and other disciplines in addition to attorneys. And I think that really provides them with a well-rounded perspective on coastal issues or environmental issues. And to be able to offer opportunities to go out into the field, to be able to present results of their research before, um, you know, town councils, for instance, or in front of folks in academic institutions. And I think that kind of gives them a really good opportunity to be able to, to really to own their work and to be able to discuss it and explain it in a real world context. And I think that they, that is something they've enjoyed a lot. Um, our funding sources for our fellowships is, is really twofold. We get internal funding from the center's partners for the law fellowship program, but also raise money for this through grant projects. So for instance, right now I have four law students working with me this summer. Two of them are assigned to a multi-year grant project, and so they've been kind of working consistently on that and have the, have had the opportunity to also work with ecologists, engineers, GIS experts. Um, and then we've had our other law fellows that have been provided with funding from the law school to work on some other work on some other issues. And I actually have these other two law fellows paired with extension specialists here in our office working on oyster issues and um, adaptation planning and climate change and coastal agriculture. And it's something that is really kind of gives them a very broad perspective of, of legal issues and how complicated they are um, to resolve. So, you know, they also participate in drafting outreach products. So that can be specific legal outreach products like our newsletter, but we're also getting them involved in being able to develop infographics and things of that nature to get them to think in different ways how to present legal information um, and especially to distill it down in layman terms uh, so, you know, pretty much anybody can hopefully understand uh, legal concepts and maybe any sorts of regulations or statutes for a topic like aquaculture, for instance, and also have them assist with planning legal workshops, continuing legal education programs to just get them involved with in the professional sphere with practicing attorneys and then also together with the faculty at UNC Law School. And um, like Julia and Stephanie, I also teach, so I teach the Ocean and Coastal Law course at, at UNC. I teach it as a seminar course, and it's something that's been a lot of fun. The other two fellowships I'll spend a lot less time on, but the Environmental Policy Internship is something that's specifically for undergraduates that are interested in the legal field, specifically in environmental law. I've been working with the College of Natural Resources here at NC State University where I'm housed, 
and we've had um, a lot of interest from students at the undergraduate level who think they might be interested in a legal career or think that they might want to be policy wonks when they grow up. Um, and this gives them a lot of real world experience as well, working on projects, either assisting me or actually assisting the law students as well. And that kind of gives them a, a really good perspective on what it's like to actually work in the legal field and to also, you know, learn from the law students as well as what it takes to succeed in that arena. And the Coastal Policy Fellowship is actually an RSP program where we provide funding to graduate students. Um, these are usually PhD level students, but also sometimes master students, where um, they work on a, a project over the course of the semester that's scientific in nature, but we all but we want them to focus on the potential policy aspects of it as well. And again, we focus on pairing them with relevant extension specialists on outreach materials. Uh, so they can actually get some community impact for their research. So we kind of, you know, we really want to be able to teach the law students and the graduate students the value, not just the value of research, but the value of it having impact in the community. So trying to kind of take it from, from A to Z, and I think it gives them a really good idea of what it's like to work in the coastal management arena and what it's like to actually work in the environmental law field and, you know, how important it is to provide information to communities in a uh, neutral manner and to be able to help them solve problems and how on in environmental issues that it's important for scientists, attorneys, engineers uh, to all come together to be able to help communities uh, get the information they need so they can solve their own problems. And I think that's about it from my end. Great. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks so much. So, Rory, I think now is a chance for you to kind of follow up um, and feel free to just kind of share um, from your perspective the value and the benefit of participating in some of these opportunities that North Carolina has offered. Yeah, so it sounds wonderful, and thank you for uh, having me talk to you guys today. Um, <clears throat> so my name is Rory Fleming. Uh, I graduated in 20, uh, 2015 from law school, and uh, currently I actually work as a uh, policy researcher in uh, the criminal justice field, but um, we'll see what happens long term. But before that, I uh, was working with the South Carolina Environmental Law Project, and they are a small boutique law firm for the public interest of protecting the environment in South Carolina. So that was really great, and uh, and something that um, my law fellowship with with Lisa and C Grant was very very helpful for. So. Um, yeah, so I, I did a couple of uh, pretty, uh, what I would say are awesome projects while there um, that I'm very proud of. Um, one was uh, this report mapping uh, coastal risks and social vulnerability, current schools and legal risks that uh, uh, myself, Lisa, and Heather Payne at UNC Law worked on together. And that was about, um, we were looking at um, social vulnerability mapping tools and how they use uh, a lot of factors such as uh, geography or economics, but also race uh, to determine, um, like, how vulnerable a particular area is. But, of course, using race explicitly raises constitutional law concerns. So, essentially, we were looking at uh, using um, these modeling techniques that would allow local governments to better protect their uh, their areas and make a more resilient uh, place to live and, like, having that, like, coexist in the same world of the law, basically. And uh, it was it was very interesting. And um, so that was that was a really great project. That, that's available on SSRN. Um, and then another thing I did while uh, working for the year, uh, for my third year of law school, uh, about 10 hours a week uh, with Lisa, was uh, on what's called heirs' property, which is uh, kind of kind of a similar type of idea with the social vulnerability, but, like, taken a slightly different direction, which um, – so basically what heirs' property is, is um, – a type of land ownership that is predominant in the American South, uh, particularly among African Americans who have inherited uh, land for, you know, hundreds of years, uh, because th these are lands that were acquired right after slavery was ended. And so 
Uh, they had this land in their family, but they didn't have the money to go find an attorney and learn how to do, well, basically hire an attorney to do wills and things like that. So, so they would die, the landowner would die without a will, and then it would pass through the, the default uh, type of land succession inheritance um, that happens when you die without a will. And so what that is is basically every uh, descendant owns, like, the same fraction. It gets it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it's uh, everyone owns a fraction, but everyone owns it in common, which means that uh, if one of the people that own, like, a 64th of the land uh, decides to sell that 64th for themselves um, because they live across the country, that ruins the entire tract of land, and the whole thing is up for grabs, and so a developer can like, essentially coerce one party and uh, ha- buy out the whole thing. Now, granted, we were writing this, as uh, Lisa said and others said, in, in a neutral and academic fashion, but um, it was it was something that we were able to, to point out and discuss how, um, how different forms of property ownership affect resiliency and, like, like what the, the types of factors that we generally think of when we think of environmental resiliency, um, so ability to bounce back from, like, a natural disaster and things like that. Um, and so that was a really cool um, intersectional, multidisciplinary uh, law and env- uh, environment uh, type project. And uh, from my understanding, uh, that one will be put out in some official format in the next month or so. Uh, that's what Lisa has told me, but that's very exciting. Um, and yeah, so I, I did a couple other things over, over uh, the, the, the course of my time, like different uh, research assignments and like keeping track on new laws that were passed uh, or being uh, proposed in uh, the North Carolina State Legislature and um, briefing cases, which is like, you know, basically just uh, summarizing, you know, the, the most important parts, like the what, what are the facts of the case? Like, what happened? Uh, what's what's the rule? Like, did the court, like, uh, you know, in in deciding a certain way, like, like decide the the case based on like one or two like theories of law and things like that. Um, I also worked on the Legal Tides uh, newsletter that we put out uh, quarterly, and that was another good experience. Um, and yeah, so so I found it very very valuable. Uh, and would recommend it to any law student, uh, especially law students interested in uh, environmental policy work or policy work in general. Um, it definitely um, helped me develop my research and writing skills like nothing else in law school did. Um, because, you know, the, the law is complex in this area. The environment is obviously complex. And it really, uh, working in, it, it, on these sorts of projects requires you as a law student to kind of go above and beyond, which I thought was really great and has definitely paid off for me now that I'm working in, in policy again um, with uh, the Fair Punishment Project at Harvard Law School. Uh, we, we just put out a report that, that I wrote, you know, about 65 70% of it, I would say, um, uh, having to do with, like, death penalty issues. And it got reported in, like, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and all this stuff. And that was pretty incredible. And uh, I, I say with confidence that without uh, without uh, the C grant opportunity and without these guidance and uh, mentorship, I don't think that I would have been able to, like, succeed on that level uh, this soon. So I'm very grateful to the program, and I'm a strong believer in it. And um, yeah, I, I hope I hope that is uh, interesting and enlightening to everyone. Uh, I would I would love to take any questions uh, that anybody anybody might have about like the student experience um, and like what what can be improved or like what else is awesome about it. Whatever you're interested in asking. Great, thanks, Rory. Thanks so much. Uh-huh. And thanks. yeah, for the folks on the phone, um, we just have. One or two more slides, but feel free to use the chat box if you do have questions for myself or Rory or Lisa uh, or Julia. Um, mm-hmm. So, right, uh, one thing I wonder, we have been focusing on the graduate education opportunities that 
the Sea Grant Legal Network offers. But I wanted to just mention quickly um, as we start to wrap up here that the Sea Grant program also helps by offering post-graduation opportunities. The National Sea Grant Law Center so it has an Ocean and Coastal Law Fellowship Program. Our fellowship program is designed for a recent graduate, um, so someone that's coming out of a JD program or an LLM program. So LLMs are like an additional year after you received your JD that um, are used to kind of build some expertise or specialization in a particular field of law. Uh, and so we've had three Ocean and Coastal Law Fellows so far. Um, Nicholas Lund was our first fellow. He's currently working in D.C. with the National Park Conservation Association. Catherine Janesey was our second law fellow, and we were so excited that we were able to keep her on and, and retain her as a staff attorney. And then Alexander Chase is currently serving as our um, law fellow right now. Our Ocean Coastal Law Fellowship Program is the only fellowship program um, in the country that focuses exclusively on ocean and coastal law issues. There's lots of fellowship programs at law schools. Many um, are on environmental law and policy, but we're the only one that can focus exclusively on ocean and coastal law. Um, and then there's also the Canal Marine Policy Fellowship Program that is run by the National Sea Grant College Program. And that was um, designed to kind of introduce graduate students, science, scientists to how policy is made and, and to engage them in science policy um, and other issues in D.C., um, but it's actually available to any graduate student that's coming out of a graduate program, and um, many of the law students who have participated in c grad programs over the years have been successful in um, gaining those fellowships and going to D.C. and done very well um, in the Canals program. And so that's another opportunity that even if you don't have um, kind of a formal connection um, with a law school in your state, um, encouraging uh, interested students from law schools within your state to consider the Canals Fellowship Program um, is also a, a good way to start building some secret connections as well. Um, and so with that, I'll um, open it up to questions or comments. And, and like I said, um, you can use the chat box to, to send questions to myself. But here's my contact information. You're welcome to contact me at any time. Um, but also, I would encourage you to visit the National Sea Grant Law Center's website, um, where we host the website for the Sea Grant Legal Network. And you can find links and information about all of the members of the Sea Grant Legal Network on our website. Julia Wyman is currently the chair of the Sea Grant Legal Network. So if you have any questions about the legal network, um, feel free to contact her. Uh, Lisa was past chair of the network and, and all the incoming chair. So you've got um, a lot of folks on the presentation today that would be happy to help you connect to other members of the Sea Grant Legal Network. Um, tell you a little more about how we built some of the graduate student opportunities that we have within our program and to help you make connections um, with uh, law schools and other programs in your state. Um, with that, I don't see any questions, but the, the webinar will be recorded and we'll be posting it later this week, and I'll send out information about that. So, again, I thank everyone for their time, for joining us today, and feel free to reach out to any of us if you have questions. And stay tuned next month when we'll be sharing some updates from the National Secret Law Center's Advisory Service. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.